the scale is basically uh, sometime eight notes to the scale, five tones to the scale, sometimes 17 tones to the scale, depending on the tradition and the area where the actual instrument is made. These ones behind me have a smaller, they come from different areas, and uh, they are a different type of balafon, the same idea. They come from Gambia, this comes from Mali, this comes from Gambia, and um, you see it's played, this is raw rubber, basically. scale we use on the piano, or approximately close to it. So this is a different... Balafon, and it's the same technique. You have the resonators, except this is a larger instrument, have almost uh, a bigger scope of the scale system. It has several scale systems. This is, has a scale system similar to the piano. This is Gambia. They're both related to the culture, so they both actually uh, have a Malinke characteristics to it. The Senegambia and the Malinke. They're both tied up by tradition of the big Mali Empire. And that was one of the largest Islamic empire in Africa, known as the Malinke Empire. And you can see that the technique of playing it has something to do with the recitation of uh, Islamic recitation. Uh, of reading and the characteristic of singing, like this. This instrument could be played by several people. Another person could be sitting there and me here, so it'd be two people playing it. And usually you have an orchestra of sometimes three people or 20 people, depending on the performance. Okay, if you have, uh, this is basically again, there are gourds, resonators underneath to make it sound the way it is. Okay, I have another one. You can see another, the same family, so actually, uh, those three could be played by a small ensemble or a small orchestra. It has a similar qualities. So you have this one. It's a little bit different. be Mali, the same technique used on this. It's a mini Kora.
this is a mini core, in other words, it's really small, because the real one is about six feet long, and this a big, huge belly is about two and a half feet in diameter. So this is really a small one. Okay, and this comes, the, the basic type of instrument comes really from the same uh, Mandingo area. However, some of these instruments are also made in Nigeria. Uh, here we have the Gundung drum, which is a talking drum. This is from Nigeria. Has a special stick to it. Uh, we have a special, usually a bent stick. It's a talking drum, so actually instead of talking, you can make it talk from you. Uh, these are all talking drums here. These are these here. And SSG drum, it's the same type. This is a mother drum. The mother drum is very important. because the mother is the foundation of the society. So the mother drum is, is a very important part of the, this group of drums known as Dundu. Uh, let me see what else I have. Uh, these are a type of, uh, these could be used as a water drum or if you have rings on your head. I don't have any rings. You can be playing it yourself if you have a lot of rings. But basically, you put the rings and you hit with your head. So this is, comes from areas in upper Nigeria, like the highlands of Nigeria, called the Joss Plateau, or the Hausa area of Nigeria. Uh, these are little kalimbas, different variety of them, another one, the made up different parts of Africa. So there's thousands of varieties of these instruments. Uh, could you tell me where you're from and how and when did you decide to come to the United States? Oh, what a question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Egypt. You know where Egypt is? In the northeast part of Africa. And uh, I grew up in Egypt, in Middle Egypt, the center part of Egypt. and. Uh, I basically was working in the field, and I, you know, went to school in Cairo, Cairo University. However, I learned agriculture, so I used to be in the villages. In the villages, uh, life is uh, is all involved with music. In the villages, I was in agriculture, you know, farming. So not quite a farmer, but you know something like that. Uh, like <laughs> uh, farming means involvement with the community and the people. You know, when you have a small, when you have a land there, like uh, 10 acres, you might have a lot of people on those 10 acres because it's a big community involvement. And it's not like here one man can cultivate 100 acres. It's involved with big concentration of people and activities that involve music and harvesting, dancing, and all that are very rich. To make your body small, bend your knees, have, you know, your back is straight, but not like this. You know, not like this. It's like, bend like, like that. Okay. The way to get up back, go down like this.
I started from my homeland, Egypt, and then from Egypt I went to neighboring countries such as the Sudan, Ethiopia. So I traveled. The reason I went to Ethiopia is to find the relationship, the connections in the Nile Valley between Egypt, the Sudan, and Ethiopia. And the connection with the beginning of religions and the, how religion influenced the musical characteristics of those areas. Uh, Ethiopia was very fantastic for me because there you find the beginnings of Islam and the very early part of Islam started there. You have the beginning of the Christian church there and uh, you have traditional African customs still in existence. So you have really, uh, and you have the beginning of some of the Hebrew thinking in an area called the Falasha. So you have all the monotheistic ideas that developed in Ethiopia plus what is we call traditional African uh, religions which are very very rich and still actually going on today. Uh, my work was involved with recording the music in the field, living in villages, living with the people. The most important part is how to live with as by yourself, with a group of people, eat with them, the, the food they eat, sleep in the same areas and become one similar to them. Because the hardest thing when you do a study in Africa is the, the biggest problem is you, not them. You know, because if you can't uh, assimilate, you, not assimilate, but become part of your environment, it becomes very difficult. Like when two people travel together, it becomes difficult. Like two people, a man and his wife, that organize a society. So all of a sudden, when you visit Africa, and you form a society like two people, like a man and his wife, or three people studying, you become an onlooker, a separate person. You're looking and studying from outside. If you are alone, then you can live the life of the group. If you can able to do that, then you really understand what the life is about. You have to move from being an onlooker an exterior viewer, like a camera, watching, to a person in the community. So it's very difficult because the, the, the minute you do that, you begin to see yourself in front of yourself because you have different habits, different eating customs, uh, different relations, you know, the whole thing becomes so impossible sometimes. But this is the way I managed to do it. actually live in the village, Live the people's, you know, I ate every kind of food you can ever imagine. Whatever food is there, I ate. I couldn't turn around and say, well, I can eat this or that. Uh, I slept the way everybody slept. I walked, everybody walked. I uh, and learned and learned the songs and the music. <laughs>
came to Kent State University, the, one of the uh, attraction to me at Kent State was, say, I was invited to come here, and one of the key was meeting uh, Edward Crosby. Uh, because when I met Edward Crosby, he was starting the Institute of African American Affairs, and I sat on the, uh, I was on one of the advisors on the formation of the Institute of African American Affairs back in 1969 and then institute developed into an African center. So uh, coming to Kent State, uh, I engaged myself as a music professor, basically, uh, in an area called ethnomusicology, or the study of music within cultural context. So it really involved the study of music from an anthropological, sociological way. And in the process, I developed a center for the study of world music in 1969 which now became the Center for World Music, all right? And I came here as a full professor to start with. I came from Howard University. I was a professor at Howard University, and I came here as a professor. And in the, during the years, uh, I was named a university professor, which is uh, the highest rank you can get. I met a lot of people. I met a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of people in the, in the, in the in the African traditions of activities. Uh, I met people in Atlanta University, uh, which were very important. Uh, I met people in Jamaica, like uh, Rex Nettleford, which is one of the leading dancers and traditional Africanist in, uh, uh, in, in Jamaica. I met uh, Kofi Opoku, one of the greatest Ghanaian uh, dancers that have a company that came here it was strange because we looked for each other for eight years and we ended up seeing a meeting at Kent State. You know, it was wonderful. And so he was a great leader in the, in the traditional African dance. Uh, I met the Fela Shawande, the high priest of the uh, chief and high priest and philosopher of the Yoruba traditions and how he carried it through. Uh, of course, I met this man that came here a uh, great scholar, uh, Kwabin Nketia, who is an important scholar in African studies, and you met him the other day. I met him uh, some years ago. Uh, we had a conference together back in 19, I believe, uh, 67, something like that, back at uh, uh, Northwestern University. Uh, I met um, Kebede, Ashanafi Kebede, who used to be in Ethiopia great scholar and director of the African Studies in uh, Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, this is in the area of Africa, in the areas of uh, Broadway or the areas of classical music. Of course, I studied with Errol Copeland, uh, the dean of American music. I met one of the greatest composers in the world and talked to him and invited me back in the 50s, Igor Stravinsky. I met him in uh, in Aspen, Colorado. Of course, I worked with Martha Graham. She's 96 years old. I did four compositions for her. She's one of the greatest time dancers of the, our time. Uh, and uh, one of the most phenomenal people in choreography and dance of today. I met uh, Rudolf Nureyev, who came and did some of my music here. I uh, played music under the direction of, uh, I had a composition that Leopold Stokowski, who did uh, uh, Fantasia, if you've seen Fantasia, Leopold Stokowski at the Metropolitan, uh, at, the, uh, at Carnegie in New York, and I uh, was soloist on my Egyptian drum when he conducted one of my compositions. I want to know how you feel about the African Americans that you have met. Do you think they're aware of their heritage and um, their culture? And how can they improve on that? That's a very serious question, because that's one that concerned me a great deal. Uh, when I first came here, there was, uh, well, in the 50s, there wasn't much consciousness. Those things were scattered. There was still that struggle. <coughs> but in the 60s, of course, I. Uh, the people I used to listen to, Carl Michael, you know, uh, 
one of the leaders in uh, uh, Black is Beautiful movement, and I met a lot of some of the people in the Black and Beautiful movement from France uh, called Negritude. The, in the 60s, there was a lot of consciousness about African heritage and Africanity and African uh, beauty and the, the tradition of Africa. Uh, there was a lot of things that came out in the market very, very fast, though. Some of it was not that good. By the demand of those times, you probably, in, you were very little or not even born yet, right? I was born in the 60s. <laughs> you were born in the 60s, okay. Um, so, just my experience at Howard University in the 60s is tremendous because the students were very much aware of what they wanted. They, I was there when the students took over the university, when Martin Luther King came there. Uh, I was, the students, after they took over the universities for their demands, drafted some of the professors to teach at the camp where the poor people gathered. And I was one of the people who gathered there to talk to the people who marched with Martin Luther King. Uh, and I, I felt the energy and the, the need of development, the, the scope, the vision was in the formation, you see. Uh, it's, the things are here, the, the, the richness of the Afro-American, the black American, it's really unlimited. What stands in the way is somehow awareness. So there was an awareness in the beginning, somehow, suddenly, that awareness stopped. And the Afro-American or the black American who was, from being very proud of being black and beautiful, it became a little bit removed from the African connection and started looking at Africa as something remote. See, the idea of Africa is not to become an African. The idea of Africa is to tie up with the knowledge, tie up with the skills. But if you, if you think Africa is backward and people are growing up with that idea, then they, they want to separate from it. But the fact is, the, the heritage in the sciences is enormous, the heritage in culture is enormous, the heritage in, in development is enormous. You, you know, you go, just look at an African village, it doesn't have child abuse. You know, it doesn't have uh, a violence, the African village. It doesn't have, uh, uh, it has a community of the highest civilized, you know, if I can use the word civilized, the highest caliber of a society you can see in an African village. The, the in immediate relationship, the beauty of the family and the, and the and the development of the family and the balance and the harmony is enormous. The skills, you know, just showing you this musical instrument, the technology, actually it's much more higher when you come to the details of the technology. Mm -hmm. So all these are important things that the Afro-American has to come to grips. Well, to really get, come to hold on to and to realize that you can't sit there. You, every, every black American has, a, has a, a river of gold under their feet, but they don't see it. And the reason they don't see it is that because they've been misdirected, miseducated. So how do you think they can become aware of that? I think awareness has to come with, uh, with group activity, with... Uh, engagement like okay like you, you are in my class when we deal with music we didn't only deal with music music is a way of life right music is a way of seeing the whole universe the african music is not just an entertainment removed from life you see so once you take a class you should see the the, the entire relationship <laughs>
basically African music has a cosmic understanding. It's not just a simple instrument that you play. It has something to do with the vibration, with the elements of those vibration, how it works. Something our Western science doesn't even know. You see, there's an enormous amount of things. How this vibration relates to the society, how it works together, uh, the, the different rhythms that works, uh, reflect the social structure. The musician in Africa is aware. Just, just take the drummer. If you want to take the drummer as a, a model. So if you want to become a drummer, you have to be aware, social, political, cultural, historical. So you say, okay, I'm going to be a drummer. All right. Start be aware of what's around you. Who are you? you say, Who am I? Where I come from? What, what, is the, what is the scene? Who am I voting for? And who's doing what? And why is this going on? That's the African musician, you see.
no time now to say, well, I'm this and that, and you're going to discriminate against me, I'm discriminating against you. I'm going to go beyond that. So you have to go beyond the color and realize it, how, and if somebody makes remarks, whatever, you know who you are. You don't, you don't bother. You don't want to bother. You, wanna, you don't want to stop if somebody insults you. You see, why, why should you stop? You know who you are, right? If you know, if you know who you are, would you bother if I, if I threw a word at you? No, you know who you are. You just pass on. Go on. You know, you know who you are, so why bother? Why, why stop? Why react, you see? You go on. 